Hey everyone, it's Mr. Drake. This is our second video on 1920 Society. This one will not be quite as fun. This is the one that uh, talks about how not everything was jazz music and flappers in the 1920s. Um, there was also a very conservative element uh, present in America during that time, and this video is going to review some of those things. So with that in mind, let's get started. When we're talking about conservative aspects of the 1920s, prohibition is a little bit ironic because it leads to some of the more liberal aspects of the 20s that we think of, like speakeasies and you know the big parties and stuff like that. Um, but prohibition was a long-held dream of progressives and populists and women's groups going all the way back to the late 1800s and maybe even earlier than that. And it was called the Noble Experiment because they believed that uh, it would lead to uh, less crime, less disease, and you know people generally being happier and more virtuous. So when it took effect in 1920 with the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act, the Volstead Act is also known as the National Prohibition Act. That's the law that was passed by Congress that set the penalties for violating prohibition and stuff like that. Um, there was very high hopes that uh, that prohibition would work and that society would improve. But really, the opposite happened. Um, it did decrease consumption of alcohol. Not by a lot, probably. There's no official statistics about alcohol consumption at that time, obviously, since it was illegal. But most estimates uh, figure that about 40% um, decrease in alcohol consumption occurred in America. So there were still plenty of people consuming it. Uh, ironically, the Volstead Act outlawed the manufacture, sale, and transport of alcohol but not the consumption, so it's kind of a strange loophole there. Uh, there was a fairly vibrant beer and wine industry in America before 1920 that Prohibition pretty much squashed. Um, some breweries got by doing other things during the 20s, manufacturing other stuff like Anheuser-Busch and Miller, um, major breweries you know of today. Um, but the, the locally owned and operated breweries that exist in very large numbers in America now um, didn't really exist again until the 1980s and 1990s. Some of the um, less savory effects of prohibition, of course, the rise in organized crime. Al Capone is a exemplar of that. The uh, famous bootlegger from Chicago who made a mint selling illegally produced alcohol. The most uh, notable thing about prohibition in terms of its effectiveness is that it really wasn't all that enforceable. And plenty of quote-unquote underground bars, which were called speakeasies, because you had to speak nice and quietly so you didn't get caught, um, popped up in large cities in massive numbers. And the police, many of whom probably drank themselves, had no interest whatsoever in busting these up. Um, some other interesting effects of Prohibition, um, mixed drinks, because bootleg alcohol tasted so horrible in most cases that it had to be covered up with something. So they would start using like fruit juices and bitters and um, sodas and stuff like that to mix with this you know, rot gut alcohol. So that's the... Um, golden age of the cocktail. And then stock car racing. If you're one of my students, you're here in North Carolina, the hot home of NASCAR, so to speak. Um, people who made moonshine liquor in the mountains, especially of North Carolina and Virginia, um, and which they were doing before Prohibition, by the way, and continue to do afterwards. But um, to outrun the authorities who were trying to shut down their illegal liquor stills, they would soup their cars up to go super fast. And then when Prohibition ended, they had these fast cars and no reason to make them go fast anymore. So they started racing them. And that's how NASCAR got its start in the mid-20th century. Eventually, everyone realized that Prohibition was just a dismal failure and a terrible idea to begin with. And uh, in 1933, there was a law passed by Congress to allow low-alcohol content beer and wine. And then several months later, the 21st Amendment was ratified, which repealed Prohibition altogether and left decisions on prohibition to the states. And some states did remain dry for a time, and there are still localities throughout the country that are dry, but it's no longer nationally enforced. There were a lot of religious leaders in America in the 1920s who looked around and believed that the country was just going to hell in a handbasket. And so the fundamentalist movement begins to emerge. It was a movement of conservative theologians and preachers that saw themselves as 
um, called to bring America back from the brink of eternal hellfire and damnation. Um, so the, a lot of people began to, you know, preach on a wide scale during this time um, and warn America about, you know, where it was headed. Uh, a couple of the more notable fundamentalist preachers, were, uh, Billy Sunday is one, he mainly preached against the consumption of alcohol, which he called demon rum. Um, and Billy Sunday was fairly famous already before he was a preacher because he had been a Major League Baseball player in the late 1800s, and so people knew who he was, and as a result, um, you know, he had a following already. Uh, and he preached a very orthodox Protestant viewpoint, as many uh, fundamentalist preachers did. Literal interpretation of the Bible, for instance. You know, the idea that the world was created in six days, that, you know, Adam and Eve were created by God in the Garden of Eden. Um, again, literal interpretation of the Bible. Um, Amy Semple McPherson used radio and mass media to get her message out. Billy Sunday had been... Um, a traditional kind of tent revival preacher. And he sort of fell off when people like McPherson came along who were able to harness media to get their message out. Uh, she founded the Church of the Four Square Gospel uh, out in California, which is still sort of a small denomination that exists today. Um, she had a massive temple built in Los Angeles with uh, donations to her church called the Angelus Temple, which is seen there in the background, and you note the radio towers on either side. Um, she did broadcast her sermons every week, and she was able to gain a very, very wide following as a result, uh, and it didn't hurt that she was fairly good-looking, uh, and a lot of uh, men probably followed her for that reason. She had a bit of a downfall in the uh, mid-1920s, though. She disappeared um, after swimming on a beach in California, and it was assumed she had drowned. There was a funeral. There was a burial without a body. And then several weeks later, she was found in the desert in Arizona, and she claimed she had been kidnapped and tortured and beaten for weeks and was able to escape and then walk 20 miles through the desert across the border to, uh, to finally, you know, be rescued. Um, but most people didn't really believe the story, and there have been a lot of rumors for a long time that she was having an affair with um, someone who had worked for her church and all of that. And so as a result, she, you know, even though none of that stuff was proven, uh, as a result, she began to, to lose favor and began to be viewed as uh, somewhat hypocritical. But um, she is really the first, you know, mass media evangelist. Um, and those become much more prevalent throughout the 20th century with people like Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and all of those, too. Um, she was kind of a trailblazer in that regard, though. Fundamentalism was quote-unquote put on trial in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee um, during an event called the Scopes Trial, usually referred to as the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, the Scopes Trial centered around an act that was passed by the Tennessee State Legislature in 1925 called the Butler Act, which banned the teaching of evolution in schools. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union put out a call that they would be willing to uh, defend anyone that was arrested for violating that act, um, saying that it was unconstitutional, separation of church and state, all that. Um, so in Dayton, Tennessee, a small, fairly sleepy town in Tennessee, um, the city leaders looking to get some attention for their town, some publicity, um, convinced a substitute biology teacher named John Scopes to talk about evolution in a class that he was subbing in. And he allegedly did, and he reported himself, and he was arrested, and he was put on trial. And it becomes a major media circus with pro-evolution people there, pro-creation people there. Just Everyone just sort of descends on the town, media from all over the country. Uh, the famous author H.L. Mencken covered it for the Baltimore Sun and uh, wrote a lot of articles um, about the, uh, the trial, and it it was just a it was a zoo uh, really, and it didn't hurt um, that both sides called in the big dogs to argue out the case. The prosecution ended up bringing in William Jennings Bryan, who was well known as a very conservative Protestant fundamentalist, and so he essentially aided the prosecution during the trial. And then Clarence Darrow, who was probably the most famous lawyer of his day. 
was uh, sent by the American Civil Liberties Union to serve as the defense attorney. And so it really became more about these two guys. And, I mean, everyone knew Scopes was guilty. Like, that wasn't really the issue. Like, Scopes readily admitted that he'd broken the law. So what the Scopes trial became was a referendum, so to speak, on creationism versus evolution. And the high watermark of the trial was when Darrow, in a fairly unorthodox move, called Brian onto the witness stand as a witness, as an expert on the Bible. And they had this big give and take that lasted all day. And Darrow just sort of browbeat Brian about his beliefs. And as a result, made him look sort of silly um, and, and made him look old fashioned and um, unbending and, and all of that. So in the end, you know, again, the guilt was never an issue. Scopes was found guilty. He was fined a hundred bucks. Um, the, Conviction was actually thrown out on appeal because the fine was set by the jury when state law said that the fine had to be set by the judge. So Scopes got off on a technicality and didn't have to pay the fine. But again, not really the important part of that case. Um, the Scopes trial, like I said, sort of made fundamentalism look uh, old-fashioned and and not in keeping with you know the modernization of America in the 20s. Uh, H. L. Mencken is a prime example of that. The writer for the Baltimore Sun, he you know said Dayton was a nice town, but basically characterized the people who lived there as a bunch of clay-eating hicks and and um, you know people who weren't incredibly intelligent or anything like that. And so um, the fundamentalist movement does endure, but it really never recovered um, the popularity that it had throughout a lot of the 1920s. There's also no shortage of racism and nativism in America in the 1920s. If you're one of my students, we've already talked about the Emergency Quota Acts of 1921 and 24, which pretty much cut off uh, European immigration, especially immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe uh, at that time. Some other notable examples of nativism in the 20s, Sacco and Vanzetti uh, were two Italian immigrants who were arrested uh, for murder in a robbery gone south on fairly flimsy evidence um, in, the, in 1926. And uh, they had a lot of stuff going against them. I mean, they were immigrants, they were Italian immigrants, they were anarchist Italian immigrants, and they were Catholic anarchist Italian immigrants. So pretty much everything that you, you know, would uh, not like if you were a nativist in the 20s. And this is in Massachusetts where this took place, by the way. But they were convicted. Um, the trial was pretty much a sham. The judge actually referred to Sacco and Vanzetti as, quote, anarchist bastards, end quote, uh, during the trial. Um, and they were executed in the electric chair in 1927, which caused an international outrage because most people believed it was unjust. Um, they were um, pardoned posthumously in 1977 by the Massachusetts state government. Some good it did them. The Ku Klux Klan, which had been dead as of Grant's presidency when he killed them during Reconstruction, resurrects in 1915 when a movie comes out called Birth of a Nation, which makes the Ku Klux Klan look great and makes black people look bad. Um, and the Klan grows in you know massive numbers. Uh, to the point where they have 5 million members by the mid-1920s, and now they hate everybody. It's not just African Americans. They don't like Catholics. They don't like immigrants. They don't like anyone. Um, they eventually fall off when one of their leaders in uh, Indiana was convicted of murder, and that was one of the big states they existed in, but um, they you know, remain sort of a fringe political, political organization to this day. The 1928 election uh, is somewhat an example of nativism. Herbert Hoover, who was the Republican, uh, defeats Al Smith, who was the ca first Catholic to run for president for a major party. And Hoover probably would have won anyway. Um, the economy was good. Um, he was riding on the coattails of you know Harding and Coolidge's pro-business ways. But um, the election was pretty ugly, the campaign was, with you know people accusing Smith of wanting to bring the Pope over to serve as king and stuff like that. Not kidding. That was actually an accusation that was made. That will do it for today. Um, feel, free, feel free to post questions in the comment section or ask them in class. Cheers.